it as an extension of our library's mission to promote freedom of information and the open exchange of ideas. Uh, and none of us will agree entirely with everything that's written in the library's books or databases and provide them so the community we can serve can learn from a wide range of viewpoints. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, um, with John Martinez as our speaker, on Malcolm X, the internationalist and revolutionary, we have more um, resources up here and also on the Cozy Library webpage. At the end of the discussion, I will ask that everyone fills out a brief survey. Um, we invite staff, faculty, and community members to speak, uh, and we also encourage students to propose different ideas, or if any student group wants to speak, please talk to me, I can really take one. So without further ado, um, we're going to have John Martin speak. Thank you for coming, John. Thank you, Samantha. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Hi. My name is John Martinez. I am an ESL instructor here at Seattle Central College. And I'm also the, an officer of the Teachers Union. I am the chair of the AFT Human and Civil Rights Committee. And I, went, I want to thank the library and, and uh, the COSI for allowing me to be here and present my program on Malcolm X, Revolutionary and Internationalist. Uh, also, my presentation and my, uh, my uh, ideas are all mine. They don't represent the union, but what I'm presenting here today has been inspired by my work in the union, trying to educate others about these important issues that we still face today around discrimination and, uh, and, and uh, separation. So let me introduce Malcolm X revolutionary and internationalist. I'll go a little quickly because I would like time at the end for conversation also. But across the United States, Malcolm X's name is still prominent in many different ways. For example, in San Francisco, there's a public school with his name. In Chicago, Community College, the Health Science Building also has his name, Malcolm X College. In our culture, there, uh, Spike Lee produced a movie in 1992 on parts of Malcolm X's life with Denzel Washington. There have also been stage productions in New York, Chicago, and many places around the country about Malcolm X. Uh, this one is uh, meeting a, a, a uh, hypothetical, make-believe meeting between Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King. That's always fa a favorite topic of, of uh, of just conversation. In 1999, the United States Postal Service issued a stamp. It was part of the Black Heritage Series, which included many prominent African Americans in US history. But they also issued a stamp with Malcolm X's image on it. So this was, uh, you can still find it in a collector. If you, if you contact collectors, you can still find that stamp. And only this year, this summer, here's Colin Kaepernick, the uh, quarterback of San Francisco 49ers, he's speaking out about participating in Black Lives Matter. And at a press conference, you can see the hat he wears has X representing Malcolm X. And the t-shirt he wears has the image of Malcolm X meeting with Fidel Castro in 1960. So you can see that in our culture and in our political life, the image of Malcolm X is still prominent. However, we need to make time to remember what Malcolm X said, <coughs> what he did, and what he stood for. So that's why I'm happy to be here today. Uh, many organizations from Black History Studies departments, academics, political activists, uh, meet regularly to talk about Malcolm. And they actually find more and more information about Malcolm X's life. Just recently, his notebooks that he, that he collected while he traveled in Africa have become available, and scholars are reading his notebooks to learn about the people he met and the ideas that he encountered while traveling through Europe and Africa in 1964. But probably the most important introduction most people have of Malcolm X is his autobiography. So this was uh, published just a few months after he was killed in 1965. But since that time, his autobiography, which was co-written by Alex Haley, uh, 
has sold over 3 million copies. And I think most people have seen this in used bookstores, libraries. Uh, we have it here in hardcover in our library, also in paperback in our library, so if you want to read it. But it, it's a powerful uh, uh, narrative about his life. He wrote it with Alex Haley in the last two years of his life. And I recommend it. I use this book as a source for most of my material. And it's a, it's a powerful introduction to Malcolm and what he tried to do in his life. Many other books have been published with Malcolm's speeches. Uh, this is very important. He was uh, very active from 1959 to 1965. Many of his speeches were recorded, uh, but very few published at that time, except in uh, a few newspapers. Most of the speeches have been collected by Pathfinder Press, and these are also available. These I also use in order to prepare my remarks. But I believe strongly that if you read his speeches carefully, you will get the best sense of his ideas and his revolutionary thought. So Malcolm X was really born as Malcolm Little in Omaha, Nebraska, 1925. And uh, his father and mother here, Earl and Louise Little, were, uh, he, was, uh, he was a Baptist minister, and uh, she also uh, worked with him to promote uh, church meetings. Together, Earl and Louise Little were, were followers of uh, Marcus Garvey at, at that time in the 1920s, the 1930s. This was a very important and powerful movement in the United States, especially on the East Coast and in Upper Midwest in Chicago. Uh, at this time in the United States history, the situation of African American people was very desperate, very, very difficult. And with the rise of what, what they call lynching against black people, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan again in national politics, many people tried to find a way to defend themselves and to protect not only their families but culture. So the Marcus Garvey movement was very powerful in the United States. Part of his appeal was black people should be proud of their heritage and go back to Africa too. So it's many people were hoping that with this movement, they could defend themselves and also reconnect with their culture in Africa. But, if, but unfortunately, the police were able to bring charges against Marcus Garvey and his, the big operation that he had, and he was deported from the United States. But still, this movement was had a lot of impact on people, especially Earl and Louise Little. Uh, in fact, the father of Malcolm X, was not only preaching in the churches, but also beginning to explain to African American people the ideas of Marcus Garvey. And most likely, he was killed. Earl Malcolm X's father was murdered in Lansing, Michigan, because people there were against his, his words and his ideas coming from Marcus Garvey. So this was a very, uh, very tragic moment in the life of Malcolm X's family. Malcolm X, so had he, he grew up with his father dead. His mother could not uh, sustain the family, so she went to the hospital. So Malcolm X grew up uh, with living with his sister, going from uh, foster family to foster family. But he still managed to do some activities. Here you can see Malcolm X right here with the X over his head. He went back to Lansing to the high school. He has an X. On, he's on the top row with a little X over it. So he played football. And the newspaper, newspaper people found this later. And they said, here's Malcolm X. He was much better tackling football players than making tackling white people, but that was his picture from high school. But Malcolm X spent many years in prison. What had happened, if you read his autobiography, Malcolm X wanted to be Malcolm Little, rather Malcolm Little wanted to be a lawyer. So he went to speak to his counselor, like all the children did 
in the, in the middle school. And the counselor said, no, you don't want to be a lawyer. You want to be a carpenter. You want to do something else. That was a very important turning point in his life because he realized that a lot of people did not care about what happened to young black people. So his life was moving from foster home to foster home and eventually in Boston becoming involved in criminal activity. He also had jobs. Uh, he worked in different uh, furniture factories. He worked as, uh, in the auto parts factory. He also had a job working with the railroads as a porter. That was important for him because when you work on the railroad as a porter, this is what most uh, many black men did in this time, you were able to travel. So out of Boston, he had this job where he was able to go to New York, Chicago, Memphis, St. Louis, and just see how other people were living, how other black people in their community were living. So it was a part of his expansion of his personal experience, but still he was engaged in a lot of criminal activity in mostly in Boston area. And it was very serious criminal activity. Uh, it was, uh, uh, he was uh, involved with drugs, prostitution, uh, stolen goods, and uh, finally he was uh, caught and convicted to uh, really eight years in prison, but he served uh, only six. The reason he got this long sentence was because when he was caught, he and his friend were caught with two white women, which of course at that time made the crime even more serious, so the judge gave them even more time in prison for, for their criminal activity. So Malcolm X always explained, yes, I was in prison, and he explained why and what happened during that time. So this is an important part, uh, inf information from his autobiography. In prison, Malcolm X was just very vicious. He hated the situation. He didn't want to talk to anyone. He was really uh, an outsider even in the prison. But soon, he started to meet other prisoners who wanted to introduce him to another way of life. Other prisoners in Boston, Norfolk prison, uh, were members of the Nation of Islam. They were Muslims. And they were practicing Islam in the United States as taught by uh, Honorable Elijah Muhammad on the left and with his many books teaching about Islam. Malcolm's brother and sister also joined the Nation of Islam. So together, people were speaking to Malcolm about this new idea, this, these ideas, this way of life. A powerful part of this religious movement was to respect yourself, to treat yourself correctly, eat correctly, avoid pork, no smoking, no alcohol, conduct yourself correctly, and prove yourself, prove your wealth, prove your uh, self-worth by the way you behave. It was a powerful message and many people turned to this uh, at this time, including Malcolm X. So in prison he got, he became convinced that for him this would be a way to improve his life. But it also did something else for him. It just made him more curious about what the world had to offer. Elijah Muhammad taught that the history of black people and Asian people was a history of oppression by whites. That white people were the devils. And that the, the best solution for black and Asian people were to separate from white people. So Malcolm became interested in genetics, in history, in geography, and later in other sciences also because of these, these powerful ideas. In prison, he was very fortunate that the, that the library just accepted a brand new collection of books from a very wealthy man. And the library uh, made these books available to the prisoners. So for Malcolm, it was a very fortuitous combination. He had a chance now. He was locked up in prison, but he had a chance to read and satisfy his curiosity. 
So he began with the history of the world, the, the famous series by H.G. Wells and also the series by Will and Ariel Durant on the uh, stages of, of uh, society. These are huge books and full of information. But these were just the beginning for Malcolm. So in prison, he would spend all his time at the library or in his cell just reading a lot of this information. He also read on African American history. So at this time, some of the earliest books available on African American history were by uh, Carter Godwin Woodson and W.E.B. Du Bois. Normally, young black people would never see these. So this is 1947, 1948. Normally, young black people would never see these. But in prison, Malcolm had access to them. So he just, he just devoured these books. 1952, Malcolm leaves prison and he dedicates his life to the nation of Islam. He had a correspondence with Elijah Muhammad. He taught himself many different things. And immediately after prison, uh, Malcolm becomes involved with uh, building the nation of Islam. And you can see here, he becomes, quickly he becomes a minister. He is so dedicated, he is so attached, but so informed that as a minister, when he preaches in the mosque, he also uses a chalkboard to make it into a lesson. And here he makes it an etymology lesson, teaching about the origins of words and why words like Negro, and of course people use the word nigger at this time, but why words like Negro have a history that indicates a very negative concept. So Malcolm was using his knowledge to not only promote his religion, but also to educate people about their reality. Also, the Nation of Islam was uh, promoting healthy eating, so Malcolm was also uh, responsible for promoting the restaurants where people can eat better food and avoid the, the problems of a, a modern diet. And as Malcolm progressed and did more within the Nation of Islam, of course, the leadership of the, of the, of the movement wanted him to be more responsible. So here he is now consulting with uh, uh, Honorable Elijah Muhammad about the business of the movement. He was sent to travel them. Out of Boston, uh, Elijah Muhammad had asked Malcolm, please go to Chicago, New York, St. Louis, to start new mosques and to build the movement nationally. So Malcolm did. He was very familiar with traveling, meeting people, talking to people he was able to convince many people to join the Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam grew rapidly, grew rapidly at this time. And Malcolm also, at uh, this time, he was no longer Malcolm Little, but Elijah Muhammad said, you will be Malcolm X, because X represents the former slave name. Little was the family name, but probably came from a slave owner. So to indicate that they no longer had, uh, okay. they no longer had a connection with the slave owner's name. Um, ministers like Malcolm would be called Malcolm X. Sometimes he would also be called Shabazz, because Shabazz was a tribe that was lost, uh, one of the tribes of Israel that was lost, that uh, represented African American people. And here. Malcolm is part of the team that organized the publication of a newspaper called Muhammad Speaks. So this is the way they were able to promote the nation of Islam, but also promote the ideas that the white man was creating a problem for black and Asian people around the world, and that it was important for people to separate from the white man and to support those who fight for liberation around the world. So it was a very uh, uh, powerful newspaper talking about people who wanted to be free. So Malcolm was part of this publication. But Malcolm himself began to go beyond what the Nation of Islam did. So as an instill, he's a minister. 
he began to participate in bigger movements for uh, liberation, to support the liberation in Africa, and to join others who are fighting. And here, he uh, is speaking at a rally for the 1199 uh, hospital workers who were organizing their union in New York City. So even though the official message of the Nation of Islam was that white men were devils, still Malcolm knew that some of them were fighting together with other people, other colored people, to win justice, to build a union, to, make, to get better wages. So Malcolm was beginning to move beyond the limitation of Elijah Muhammad. But in New York City, Malcolm was responsible for the mosque in New York City, in Harlem. But we know in New York, New York City, we had also the world headquarters of the United Nations. So this was also a big part of Malcolm's experience at this time. So many countries were winning their freedom at this time, 19, 1950s, early 1960s, and of course, all of these representatives were sending their uh, delegation to the United Nations, and each time a new country would present itself, there would be tremendous celebration. And sometimes the celebration went into Harlem. Sometimes the delegation from the new countries would celebrate here and then go into Harlem to have a bigger celebration. Malcolm was a part of a civic group in Harlem that would organize uh, uh, parties or celebrations for the freedom people, free people of Africa. <coughs> this map is called Decolonization in Africa. And I think you can see the dates when most of these countries gained independence. Most of them were early 50s, 1960s. These, these were the years when Malcolm was in New York at the United Nations. And of course, each time the country would gain independence, it would be headlines and celebration in Harlem. So it, it was a time of tremendous uh, optimism that finally, after World War II, after England and France, and Germany had suffered so much, finally, the people of Africa were able to win their liberation, win their independence, and establish themselves as independent countries. So this was, uh, this was a very uh, important time for, for Malcolm and his ideas. Of course, uh, South Africa continued to practice apartheid. That was a long-going struggle. And I'll mention also later that in the middle, in Congo, uh, that would be an another very important area of conflict. But you can, I think you can see that this was a, a very important time for political development out of Africa. And so Malcolm related to that, and he said, let me just read it quickly, he said, and as fast as the brothers in Africa and Asia get their independence, get freedom, get strength, begin to rise up, begin to change their image from negative to positive, this African image that has jumped from negative to positive affects the image that the black man in the Western Hemisphere has of himself. It has given pride to the black man in Latin America and has given pride to the black man right here in the USA so that when the black revolution begins to roll on the African continent, it affects the black man in the United States. So already now, Malcolm is beginning to sense and, ex and explain that the world uh, movement for liberation is, is worldwide, is global. And these are, these are our ideas that he's explaining in 1965, but even before in other, other meetings. In 1955, there was a very important meeting of the newly free countries in uh, Bangong, Indonesia. It's, it was the beginning of the non-aligned movement. And, uh, and I think you can see here, there's Zhou Enlai representing China, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser representing Egypt. Many important heads of states met in 1955 to discuss the situation of the new independent countries, but discussing without the traditional colonial powers of Europe. This was important, Malcolm said, 
He said at the Van Dung Conference in 1955, one of the first and best steps toward real independence for non-white people took place. The people of Africa, Asia, and Latin America were able to get together. This agreement at Van Dung produced the spirit of Van Dung so that the people who were oppressed who had no jet planes, no nuclear weapons, no armies, no navies, and despite the fact that they didn't have this, their unity alone was sufficient to enable them over a period of years to maneuver and make it possible for other nations in Asia to become independent, and many more nations in Africa to become independent. So Malcolm was recognizing the necessity of international collaboration in order to win freedom. This became even more obvious when in 1960 the people of the Congo became the, it became the Democratic Republic of Congo. They won their independence from Belgium. Patrice Lumumba became the Prime Minister of, the, of Congo, the Democratic People's Republic of Congo. But almost from the moment that the King of Belgium <coughs> gave recognized independence, the United States and Belgian uh, military and CIA began to act against him. So in one year, there was a rebellion in the eastern part of, of the Democratic Republic of Congo, a rebellion and a civil war that was funded by the CIA. And what happened is those rebels were able to capture Patrice Lumumba. And what is really uh, uh, tragic here was Lumumba had requested support from the United Nations to resolve the conflict and to resolve it peacefully. But when the rebels captured Lumumba, the United Nations troops just stood by and watched. He was captured right in front of their soldiers of the United Nations soldiers. And within weeks, he was killed. The Congo, tremendous, tremendous mineral wealth. Uh, copper, gold, diamond, uh, uranium. Um, the corporate imperialist interests would not let anyone take this from them. This is 1960, 1961. The imperialists who controlled this wealth had learned a lesson already from Cuba. When people become independent and they want to control their country and their destiny, they may nationalize their resources. They wanted to avoid something like Cuba happening here because it was so wealthy, so, so, so wealthy. So from this day until now, the people of the Democratic Republic of Congo suffer conflict and warfare. But the corporations still come in, take out the mineral wealth, and leave the people behind poor. This was a, I mean, this started at this time. But the United States had a role in this. Malcolm said, here we have an example of planes dropping bombs on defenseless African villages in the Congo, part of the conflict. There is no urge on the part of even the so-called progressive element to try and bring a halt to this mass murder. Why? The press refers to the pilots that are dropping bombs on these babies as American-trained anti-Castro Cuban pilots. As long as they are American-trained, that is supposed to put the stamp of approval on it because America is your allies. As long as they are anti-Castro Cubans, since Castro is supposed to be a monster, and these pilots are against Castro, anybody else they are against is also all right. So Ma Malcolm was exposing the role of the United States in the Civil War and in the massacre of innocent people in the Democratic Republic of Congo. 1959, the Cuban Revolution. <coughs> this was part of a worldwide uh, revolution for liberation, and Malcolm recognized that the Cuban people were making important decisions about how to control their country. In 1960, Fidel Castro comes to speak to the United, at the United Nations. And what happened then was the delegation from Cuba went to 
different hotels to, uh, to stay in New York City, and some hotels refused to let them in because the Cuban delegation also included Afro-Cuban, black-skinned Cubans, and then other hotels demanded high security deposits from Fidel and the delegation to stay in their hotels in New York City to attend the United Nations meeting. When this got out, Malcolm, who had connections in Harlem and who used the Teresa Hotel in, as his office, invited invited uh, the, the Cuban delegation to stay in Harlem at the Teresa Hotel and for the next week, every night there were rallies to greet the Cuban revolutionaries representing, representing their country. Malcolm and Fidel were able to have long discussions. Here, he is still the minister of the Nation of Islam, but he was able to have long discussions with Fidel and his delegation about their thoughts on the world situation. Later, when Malcolm was establishing his own organization, he had invited uh, Che Guevara to come speak to his organization in Harlem. But because there were so many FBI and CIA plots against Malcolm, it was, a little, it was too dangerous for Che to make a trip and come speak at their meeting in the church. But Che and Malcolm also had discussions at this time. At the meeting in the church, Malcolm said, I love a revolutionary, and one of the most revolutionary men in this country right now was going to come out here. But he thought better of it. But he did send this message. Message It says, Dear brothers and sisters of Harlem, I would have liked to have been with you and Brother Babu, Brother Babu is uh, a delegate from Nigeria, a very revolutionary man, but the actual conditions are not good for this meeting. Receiving the warm salutations of the Cuban people, and especially of Fidel, who remembers enthusiastically his visit to Harlem a few years ago, united, we will win. Malcolm says, this is from Che Guevara, and the people there were happy and applauded. So Malcolm was also not only looking at the world revolution, but inviting the world revolution to come visit the people of Harlem. But at this time, Malcolm was still a minister of the Nation of Islam, and he still spoke about white devils. And um, CBS News in New York City produced a program in 1959 called The Hate That Hate Produced, and talking about black Muslims, not a common black Muslims on the major TV. And people said, oh, the black Muslims are for violence, killing white people. We want to make uh, violence. So this is the image of Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad. But traditional magazines also interviewed Malcolm X and ran stories and articles by him. So Malcolm X was now a national figure. So at this time, many people knew the name Malcolm X uh, in the United States, but unfortunately, the the image was one of violence. This is what the news media wanted. However, Malcolm <coughs> married a member of his church, Betty Shabazz. She was a health. Uh, she was a nurse and a health teacher, and that was her duty was to have, was, was to give health classes uh, in the nation of Islam. As a minister, Malcolm met a young boxer, and actually recruited him to the nation of Islam. Elijah Muhammad did not like boxing he did, because it was part of his approach that no parties, no drinking, no smoking, uh, no, uh, no gambling. So Elijah Muhammad was very un, uh, nervous about having Muhammad Ali as part of the mosque, but because Malcolm was his sponsor, uh, Muhammad Ali came into the nation of Islam and he adopted Islam as his religion. Later, unfortunately, the, the friendship would end because, uh, because Elijah Muhammad was jealous of Malcolm. He would separate Muhammad Ali from Malcolm. That was very sad. But in the nation of Islam, the, the path of Malcolm and the path of Elijah Muhammad would separate. On the left side, when one of the members of the nation of Islam was killed in Los Angeles by the police, Malcolm wanted to organize in the streets <coughs> to protest and to prosecute the cops. 
But Elijah Muhammad said no, no protest. And later on, when Elijah Muhammad wanted to expand the nation of Islam, he found that there were people who also wanted separation. But it was a very separation of white from black. So even Elijah Muhammad invited members of the American Nazi Party to come to a conference of the nation of Islam only because they wanted separation. So he thought they may have something in common. So these ideas about how to promote the religion, how to promote social justice, began to differ between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad. 1963 was the assassination of John Kennedy, President John Kennedy. So you can see in the newspaper that officially, the Nation of Islam says this is a very sad story, we are still mourning. But Malcolm actually saw that differently. Malcolm, when asked about the assassination of John Kennedy, Malcolm said that President Kennedy never foresaw that the chickens would come home to roost so soon. Being an old farm boy myself, chickens coming home to roost never did make me sad. They always made me glad. And of course, the media, the TV and the radio at this time, <coughs> would publish Malcolm's article, make him seem like a cynic and glad that John Kennedy died. But actually what Malcolm is saying here that President Kennedy and his administration sent violence into the world. So like chickens going out from your farm, they come back at night. So the violence came back to John Kennedy. This is what he was saying. But this just made the separation even greater between Malcolm and the leaders of the Nation of Islam. So Malcolm began to develop his ideas about change in America. What, what would it mean? So what program solution do you propose, they asked him. And he said, one of the reasons why I say it's difficult to come up and say this is the solution or that is the solution is that a chicken cannot produce a duck egg. The system can only produce what produced it. So this is important. The system can only produce what produced it. The American system was produced from the enslavement of the black man. Very important statement right there. This political, economic, and social system was produced from the enslavement of the black man, and that system is, only, is capable only of, of reproducing that out of which itself was produced. The only way a chicken can produce a duck egg is, to, is you have to revolutionize the system. And this is, of course, beginning the, uh, the thought of Malcolm X is you have to be revolutionary. This is what separated him mostly from Dr. Martin Luther King. And Dr. King thought that the system could be reformed. Malcolm had another idea. He had to revolutionize and, and bring about a new system. The presiden presidential elections of 1964 so President Johnson, who came after uh, John Kennedy, and Barry Goldwater, the senator from Arizona. So this is really interesting because at this time, President Johnson was seen as the liberal champion, the, the, the white knight who would bring justice and equality and civil rights to America. Barry Goldwater was, looked, was painted as the demon. This is by the media who would bring atomic war. To, uh, to the world. And uh, so, the, so the images were very, very powerful at this time. So they asked him, what do you, what's your position? And this, uh, this uh, response by Malcolm, I think, is really important because today, of course, we're still talking about presidential elections, but it's important even for us today. Malcolm said, it's the, si it's the same system. It's not the president who can help or hurt. And this system is not only ruling us in America, it's ruling the world. The only thing that made Johnson acceptable to the world was the shrewd capitalists. The shrewd capitalists knew that the only way that you will voluntarily run to the fox is to show you the wolf. So they created this ghastly alternative and had the whole world, even the so-called intellectuals who call themselves Marxists, and other things, hoping that Johnson would be 
gold water. And this is exactly what had happened, is that they created such a terrible image of gold water that everyone ran, went running to Johnson, even people who called themselves Marxists. He got elected, he got re-elected, and uh, soon after that he began war, in Viet he expanded the war in Vietnam and Dominican Republic. Malcolm travels to Africa, he, so he is, uh, at this time now, he is moving away from the nation of Islam. He travels to Egypt, to Saudi Arabia, Libya, in order to meet religious leaders. He still wants to promote Islam in America, but he wants to learn from the traditional leader, religious leaders from different countries. And they even offer Malcolm scholarships so that he can send young men and women to their countries to learn Islam in their, in their schools and mosques. In uh, Ghana, Malcolm meets many uh, African Americans who live there, including Maya Angelou, and they became close collaborators. She really wanted to help Malcolm build his organization. So who did you meet in Africa? Malcolm responds, I visited Egypt, Arabia, Kuwait, Lebanon, Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanganyika, Zanzibar, now Tanzania, Nigeria, Ghana, Liberia, Guinea, and Algeria. During that trip, I had audiences. Malcolm met with President Nasser of Egypt, President Marere of uh, Tanzania, President Jomo Kenyatta, who was the Prime Minister of Kenya, Prime Minister, Prime Minister Obote of Uganda, President Azikiwe of Nigeria, President Nkrumah of Ghana, President Soke Toure of Guinea. I was impressed by their analysis of the problem, and many of the suggestions they gave went a long way to broadening my outlook. Malcolm was just a private individual, but he represented, he represented the ideas of the black liberation struggle in the United States, so he was able to meet these uh, presidents of the countries. He also met the Cuban ambassadors to Ghana, the Chinese ambassador, and uh, who gave him receptions. And he met many students, African students, who shared with him uh, their situation. But he also met with the representatives of liberation organizations, such as uh, the people fighting the Portuguese in uh, Angola, Mozambique, he also met the representatives of the South African Liberation Struggle, the, the members of the ANC, and Nkomtowe Siswe. So, so Malcolm was able to meet tremendous uh, representatives of revolutions and revolutionary organizations. This was his experience in Africa. So what did he learn in Africa? Uh, he learned that all the nations that signed the Charter of the United Nations came up with the Declaration of Human Rights. And anyone who classifies his grievances under the label of human rights violations, those grievances can then be brought to the United Nations and discussed by people all over the world. For as long as you call it civil rights, your only allies can be the people in the next community, many of whom are responsible for your grievances. But when you call it human rights, it becomes international, and then you can take your troubles to the world court, you can take them before the world. So this was another indication of, of Malcolm's approach that went a step beyond Dr. King. Dr. King, Dr. King wanted to achieve reform uh, in the United States according to the Constitution, according to congressional laws. Malcolm said, no, we need to take it to the world stage and expose the United States treatment of black people right up there with South African treatment of black people. <coughs> so it was Malcolm's campaign to, to do that. This campaign and his travels in Africa were monitored and watched by the CIA, United States embassies, the British Secret Service, and others who were very worried about Malcolm meeting all these people and perhaps bringing the United States on trial in the United Nations. In fact, Malcolm was able to speak to a meeting of the heads of states of the Organization of African Unity. And he told them when he spoke to them, and this was, 
this was a very important meeting because some of them did not want Malcolm there. Malcolm did not represent a government. He did not represent a party. And more importantly, the United States made clear that if you continue to invite Malcolm to your countries, to your embassies, to your governments, we will cut your assistance. We will cut the money to your uh, redevelopment programs. So Malcolm warned them about American dollarism. American dollarism was really powerful in Africa. It still is, too. And many of these leaders would later disappear because American dollarism and American CIA intervention would lead to civil war and problems in the countries, and many of these leaders would disappear. But Malcolm had a chance to speak to them and ask them to help bring the issues of America and justice to the world court. This is what Malcolm wanted to present um, before the United Nations, and of course the United States government did not want this to happen. Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama, and the four little girls killed in the church. Malcolm also had things to say about other things, uh, other countries. For example, the People's Republic of China. Malcolm wasn't afraid. He said, 1964, China exploded her atomic bomb which was a scientific breakthrough of the oppressed people in China who suffered a long time. I, for one, was very happy to hear that the great people of China were able to display their scientific advancement, their advanced knowledge of science, to the point where a country which is as backwards as this country keeps saying China is, and so behind everyone, and so poor, could, could, could come up with an atomic bomb. Why I had to marvel at that. So even so at this time, I think most of you understand, anti-communism was very strong in the United States, but Malcolm was not afraid to speak about the big step forward of the Chinese people. American war in Vietnam. The oppressed people of South Vietnam and the entire Southeast Asia area were successful in fighting off the agents of imperialism. All the king's horses and all the king's men haven't been able to then to put North and South Vietnam together again. Little rice farmers, peasants with a rifle, up against all the highly mechanized weapons of warfare, jets, napalm, battleships, and everything else, and they can't put those rice farmers back where they want them. Somebody's waking up. So he gives praise to the people of Vietnam who fight the mighty armies of the imperialists. But of course, FBI and the CIA do not want Malcolm to survive and continue to promote these ideas. You can, all, you can still find, you can find uh, the documents now of the CIA from 1968, a little later, where they talk about how they want to control and contain the Black Liberation Movement in the United States. And many of the ideas of Malcolm they want to fight, according to their documents. So this is from the FBI and their documents. But Malcolm was murdered in 1965. Members of the Nation of Islam did shoot and kill him. But the police and political forces, because they watched Malcolm, they listened to his telephone, they read his mail, they listened. They even had people in his group, in the churches, in the mosque. Everyone knew that the Nation of Islam was trying to do something to Malcolm, and nobody did anything to warn or protect him. So finally, Malcolm was murdered. He tried to protect himself as much as possible, but it, it was finally they were able to do this. Finally, almost done, Malcolm was an internationalist in his philosophy, in his politics, not just geographically, but also uh, in time. But Malcolm was also an internationalist of it, in his heart. So remember at the beginning, in the Nation of Islam, they said white could not ma marry black. So they asked him, are you still opposed to intermarriage? And Malcolm answered, I believe in recognizing every human being as a human being. 
neither white, black, brown, or red. And when you are dealing with humanity as a family, there's no question of integration or intermarriage. It's just one human being marrying another human being, or one human being living around and with another human being. It is the white man, collectively, who has shown that he is hostile towards integration and toward intermarriage and toward those strides, those other strides toward oneness. So as you can see, he's internationalist in his mind, in his philosophy, but also in his heart. This is Malcolm X, El Haj Malik El Shabazz, 1925-1965. Thank you very much for your attention. So, Samantha? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And if anyone wants to take photos at the end here, you're welcome to. We have more books and resources up here on Malcolm X's life, um, and also about the Black Panthers, who he greatly influenced and um, relates to today with the Black Lives Matter. <laughs> Um, we have about five minutes or so for discussion if anyone has any questions or follow-up. And I'll also be passing around a survey for everyone to fill out. Yeah. And if you want a list of Malcolm's books, take one of these flyers. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mr. Martinez, so first of all, I'd like to thank you. It was very interesting. I'd like to... Uh, all the information you have to present. It was very informative. And I, I just wanted to share with the group that I, I think uh, Malcolm X was very influential in my life, so to speak, in, in, a real, in a real way. You see, I grew up in the Civil Rights Movement. And in second grade, I was reading Malcolm X, the autobiography. Now, granted, I probably didn't understand a lot of it, but it was, the, grade. But it was the spirit yeah. in it. And so uh, all those images are simply flashbacks to me. Oh. I mean, this is what we saw on TV during those times. And uh, I, I gotta say also that um, I think that what what's going on right now with the election season and everything, uh, I'm not indifferent to the implications of what the presidency is now. There's uh, obviously a, uh, some serious things going on. However, I have to say, I'm not overly troubled in this sense that decades before this election, I was already experiencing all this racism and discrimination that led up to this. I was experiencing it during the election season. And I don't have no doubt that I'll continue to experience it afterwards, and even now. But not to uh, just kind of convolute that, but uh, to say that, uh, and this goes back to Malcolm X, is that we have to change those things within ourselves that we see as wrong in others or in society. Then we become empowered to begin to see those things that need to change, be changed. That's it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very nice. Yes, as we struggle, we change. That's the wonderful process. Malcolm was changing, learning more, becoming better at his ideas and defending them. I just wanted to thank you again for your <coughs> approach to um, you know, sharing, sharing about your, your studies of, your studies of Malcolm. Much like you, just to kind of add to what he was saying, like being able to, for us to take, you know, see, the, you know, to change ourselves. One of the biggest inspirations about Malcolm is his ability to model that change within himself, and um, that, that 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 his his own internal struggles and his, his ability to model that is what made what made him so powerful with others. And, and, and so influential to others that he he was about to, he this wasn't lip service to him like he was his sincerity was real and um, you know I just I, I mean it, you couldn't talk enough 
about him like an hour doesn't do it justice for him. Like it, it, it deserves its own course among, among other things. And um, and I but I just appreciate your um, that you know you, you taking the time and, and with care and touching up on the basics. Thank you. I just want to say briefly too that uh, it was Malcolm X and his wife who uh, supported him. Even in the worst times when her house was being bombed and attacked, she said, you still, you must do this. And he continued to do his work. Yes. I noticed that a lot of the quotes you pulled were close to when he was assassinated. These like really powerful words of like, this, there has to be change through the world, through America. And I was taking note of when they were when he was speaking, a lot of them were in February of 1965 or January of 1965. And to see that he, know, like knowing that his life was on the line even more so than ever, just continued to drive that and even like was stronger in his deliverance of what had to happen is really moving. It's quite powerful. There are other books. Um, uh, Number eight, Marika Sher Sherwood, uh, Malcolm X Visits Abroad. He's traveling in, in uh, Africa, and he does not sleep. He must go to the next country and meet the other people and meet the revolutionaries. He's on fire. The last year of his life, Malcolm X is on fire. He's learning, and he's explaining things. And you're right. It, it was, uh, it's tremendous to read. His, uh, his also... Um, Number two, Malcolm X, the final speeches. You get that sense when you read his words. His clarity and his expression are really powerful. Yes? Thank you again for coming to talk, John. Um, I appreciate that you pulled so much like press clippings and talked about how the media like did demonize him for um, trying to speak about systemic change and not just kind of trying to reform the system, but really sharing kind of like the violent underbelly of things that the government didn't want other nations to know about. And I think that's really important for us to think about whatever our opinions are, just to be very like um, discerning and to look at different like intentions that the media and different publications want you to think about with different um, grassroots and political movements. Um, because there is so much struggle just in the last 50 years to um, fight for a right to um, assemble peacefully and or to have radical ideas to look at violent systems. So thank you for bringing that up. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Any other questions? I can stay here a little longer. Some of you need to leave. But uh, is, that, is that okay, Samantha? Yeah, yeah I think so, right? Some so of you, I understand you need to leave. Yeah. So that's okay. Otherwise, we'll just take another question. <laughs> If you all want to leave your surveys um, at your seats, I'll collect them afterwards. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.